My name is Ottaviano Canuto, and I'm a senior fellow at the Policy Center for the New South. This is the ninth of a series of short videos dealing with subjects covered in my recent book, Climbing a High Ladder, Development in the Global Economy. Today, we approach financial globalization as part of the global environment in which countries have tried to climb the income ladder in the last three decades. Financial integration refers to an individual country's linkage to international capital markets. Financial globalization refers to increasing global linkage created through cross-border financial flows. You may recall this chart from our first video of this series when uh, we highlighted the two big waves of trade globalization, both in blue in the chart. Keep in mind that there is a lot of back and forth of in and out of purchase and sale in financial assets relative to trade of goods and service. So naturally financial integration of countries and financial globalization led to the extraordinary uprise of financial assets and liabilities as a share of GDP that you see in the chart. Until the stability since the global financial crisis of 2008 to 2009. And indeed, after a tremendous rise in the uh, starting in the 90s, financial globalization as measured by the ratio of the stock of foreign assets to world GDP seems to have reached the plateau since the global financial crisis. Post-2007 ratios seem to have been the apparent peak of a high wave of financial globalization rising from the mid 90s, which likewise saw soaring external financial assets and liabilities and degrees of financial openness, reaching levels triple those before the Second World War. The bars in the chart show numbers of episodes of capital account liberalization, while the lines depict gross foreign assets of advanced economies and of emerging markets in developing countries. So as you can see in the chart, financial globalization has mainly happened amongst advanced economies. The rise in cross-border movements of financial assets since the mid 90s has been remarkable among advanced economies. According to the 2017 annual report from the Bank for International Settlements, the BIS, cross-border financial assets and liabilities have increased from 135% to above 570% of GDP since the mid 90s for advanced economies, whereas they have moved from approximately 100% to 180% of GDP on the side of emerging markets. Financial openness also rose faster than trade openness in emerging market economies, albeit at a much slower pace. In general, two major processes lead to rising cross-border financial transactions. First, there is a mutually reinforcing association with increases in foreign trade and production, trade globalization as approached in the first video of this series. Even if foreign trade corresponds simply to movements of commodities and finished goods, basic international financial links, for instance, trade finance and cross-border payments are pulled along. The connection increases with the emergence of cross-border value chains and for investment of corporations abroad, which leads to acquisition of assets and liabilities and corresponding management of exposures. But in addition to financial operations derived from trade and production relations, the active management of balance sheet positions might also lead to cross-border financial transactions as part of the processes of allocation and diversification of savings. And as we approach in our video on advanced economies becoming big balance sheet economies, financialization of advanced economies had naturally a spillover in terms of cross-border capital flows. But the composition of, uh, of global uh, assets crossing border has changed. See, different types of flows dominated in different periods. 
in the 70s, capital flows were predominantly debt flows to the public sector, which accounted for the bulk of the increase in cross-border positions. This was followed in the, in the 80s uh, with an increased importance of foreign direct investment, FDI, and portfolio equity. The share of portfolio equity in total flows then rose further in the 90s. In the period between the global financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic then saw a decline in debt flows offset by an increase in FDI, for indirect investment, and portfolio equity and debt. So alongside the apparent stability of the recent times, there has been a deep reshaping of cross-border financial flows, featuring debanking and an increasing weight of non-banking financial cross-border transactions. Sources of potential instability in long-term funding challenges have morphed accordingly. Uh, in the case of uh, emerging market economies, particularly, we have seen uh, some change in the composition of the uh, uh, of gross liabilities of those countries, with declines in foreign debt being more than compensated for by portfolio equity and foreign direct investments. The global rising share of non-lending financial transactions exhibited in the previous chart was particularly accentuated in the case of emerging market economies. Now, as uh, the BIS remarketed in its 2017 annual report, such purely financial processes bring some decoupling between real and financial openness. Let me explain this a bit. You may wonder at this juncture how to connect this discussion that we're having today with the global current account imbalance that we approached two videos ago in this series. After all, Current account imbalance ultimately lead to changes in net stocks of foreign assets and liabilities of a country. Real and financial sides of the economy interact. And although capital flows may obviously affect the current transactions that make up for current account imbalance above the line in the balance of payments, purely financial processes may create decoupled dynamics. Well, uh, European banks have been at the core of the, of the process, both the surge and the pause of the wave of financial globalization since the 90s. European banks wrote their own chapter of that story. The European integration set the stage for their expansion, going well beyond the Eurozone's limits. This chart shows the substantial piling up of European banks' foreign claims in the run-up to the global financial crisis, followed by an also substantial retrenchment. Some banks outside Europe have partially occupied the space left by their European counterparts, but not to the same extent. Lending by European banks was behind two of the major, major contributing factors to the rising wave of financial globalization. First, the inauguration of the euro followed by markets initially converging their assessment of risk premiums across the zone to, uh, downward toward German levels, boosted cross-border transactions. As we have already touched upon in our videos on the bag, big balance sheet economies and on and the other one on current account imbalance. According to the uh, 2017 annual report of the BIS, quote, between 2001 and 2007, 23 percentage points of the increase of the ratio of advanced economies' external liabilities to GDP was due to intra-euro area financial transactions and another 14 percentage points to non-euro area countries' financial claims on the area, end quote. Furthermore, as we also have approached in this series, European banks also played an active role in the asset bubble blowing process in the US financial system. European banks used US wholesale funding markets to sustain exposures to US borrowers through the shadow banking system. Despite their small presence in the domestic US commercial banking sector, the weight of European banks in terms of overall credit conditions was magnified through the shadow banking system in the United States 
that relies on capital market-based financial intermediaries, which intermediate funds through securitization of claims. So picking short-term resource in monetary markets to fund long-term, say, asset-backed securities, from an accounting sense, were registered as simultaneous short-term capital outflows and long-term capital inflows in the US, netting themselves. The retrenchment of European banks foreign claims, uh, showing the chart, followed both the US asset bubble burst, starting 2007, and the Eurozone crisis in the years after 2009, as well as business-driven reasons, losses, decisions to deleverage balance sheets, tighter banking regulation, and the orientation toward domestic assets, assumed by post-crisis unconventional monetary policies, also had an impact. These factors have also led to deleveraging balance sheet shrinking and domestic reorientation by banks in the other crisis affected advanced economies. Although some banks from outside advanced economies have expanded their foreign lending, including the Chinese, levels of global financial openness have been maintained thanks to the growing flows of known lending instruments, debt securities, portfolio, equity, and FDI. So one may say that tectonic plates uh, under global banking have shifted in the sense that uh, the global financial crisis reversed a decades-long expansionary trend of international activities by banks from advanced countries. From the late 70s to 2008, Banks found new opportunities for intermediation in increasing cross-border capital flows and also raised their profiles in domestic credit provision abroad. That's why the pre-2008 era in global finance may be called a great bank leveraging. A great bank deleveraging started when, under market and regulatory pressures from 2007 onwards, Banks were forced to liquidate assets and retrench lending. Bank lending fell from 68% of global GDP in early 2008 to 50% in 2009, where it has remained. Raising more capital would have been the alternative to selling assets and shrinking loan portfolios, but clearly the confidence in the solidity of banks' edifice had evaporated. Japanese banks did not embark on the great bank leveraging as they had spent the previous two decades healing from their own previous financial follies. U.S. banks managed to make rapid progress in the leveraging and their loan deposit ratios had already declined substantially by 2011. It is on the European side that the process kept unfolding at high speed and yet failed to reach comfort levels in terms of capital asset ratios. As we have shown here, while advanced economies return to a path of rising balance sheets and total global cross-border flows appear to stabilize, there was an underlying shift toward FDI and non-banking financial flows. A second point to highlight is the fact that the apparently greater stability of global finance might conceal other fragilities. Some features of the new dynamics of financial globalization, as McKinsey called it, may embed in it greater stability. Higher capital buffers and minimum amounts of liquid assets have reduced the weight of bank lending and, the, and their intrinsic features of mismatch and volatility of banks' balance sheets. The greater share of equity in FDI, in turn, may carry longer term return horizons and closer alignment of risks between asset purchasers and originators. The unwinding of debt financed huge current account imbalance that we saw in uh, two videos ago, characteristic of the global economy in the run up to the global financial crisis has also contributed to such a view of global finance entering a more stable phase. However, Flows FDI, of point direct investment, partially correspond to disguised debt flows and or transfers motivated by tax arbitrage or regulatory evasion. 
Cross-border debt flows, including securities in turn, are also sensitive to global factors, besides being highly sensitive to and procyclical with respect to monetary financial conditions in either the source and or the destination country. Uh, so there are also blind spots left by the banking hitherto, not preempted by non-banking financial transactions. For instance, cross-border de-risking by global banks has entailed closure of correspondent banking relations in many countries in which the paucity of alternatives has led to negative consequences for local financial dynamics. By the same token, the arm's length distance between asset holders and liability issuers intrinsic to debt securities and portfolio equity in the absence of the project finance role played in the past by international investment banks often constrains the cross-border financing of greenfield investment projects to FDI possibilities. Additionally, it is, it, it is also worth referring to the potential transformative impact and corresponding need for regulatory adaptation of digital technologies on cross-border finance. We may well be on the brink of an additional metamorphosis of global finance and the stability that may bring. The transformation of global finance has not suppressed the need for policies to monitor and cope with risks. On the side of recipients of net capital inflows, domestic agendas of institutional strengthening to reinforce alignment of risks between investors and countries, together with regulatory vigilance against excess financial euphoria or depression remain necessary. The bar in terms of domestic institutional quality, corporate governance standards, business environment, has been raised in the new phase of global finance. Also, and finally, even when financial globalization supports economic growth, it can be unequalizing, depending on situation and circumstance. Uh, capital flows boosting growth depends on countries first making progress in strengthening policies and institutions, thereby limiting the volatility of those flows and reinforcing that they will be directed toward appropriate uses and sectors. Limiting the macroeconomic volatility associated with capital flows through the application of counter cyclical macroeconomic policies will have favorable distributional consequence since such a volatility disproportionately hurts the poor. There are other potential unequalizing effects of financial globalization. For instance, it shifts the burden of taxation more from mobile factors, capital and highly skilled labor, to less mobile factors, low skilled labor. This and other aspects make financial globalization a bit different from what we approached in this series, individual on relationships between trade and global inequality. We will return to capital flows in our future video on macro prudential policies, a chapter of which corresponds to capital flows management. The point that we want to highlight here is the fact that uh, uh, after the first phase of a huge increase uh, in financial flows, the shares of GDP, they apparently uh, went on a phase of stability since the global financial crisis. But there is a very important metamorphosis taking place in the composition of those flows. And the, the, the potential and the risks have shifted according to that metamorphosis. Now, you will find a discussion uh, on the topic of this video. That is to say, the metamorphosis of financial globalization in chapter three of my book that you can find on those places on the slide. In the next video, we will approach the third shifting tectonic plate under the global economy in the last decades, rising and falling prices of nature during and after the super cycle of commodity prices. Stay tuned.